This podcast details true crime cases. It contains adult themes and may contain descriptions of violence. This episode contains explicit language. It is not intended for children. Listener discretion is advised. Thank you for joining me for today's episode of Once Upon a Crime. This is Chapter 2 in the series, Last Stop, where I detail crimes that happened on public transportation. One of the things that I try to do on this podcast is to, when possible, give you some insight behind the crime, why some crimes happen, how they unfolded, and what is behind the decisions some make to commit a crime. This week, I think you will find that there is a whole host of reasons as to why things unfolded the way they did on June 12, 2000, in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. In this case, I think you may agree that several factors were at play and contributed to the tragedy that occurred that day. Some of these factors include, of course, the perpetrator, but also the police, the local government, and perhaps the community and the media as well. You can be the judge. This is Chapter 2 of Last Stop, the hijacking of Bus 174. A note before we begin. This case takes place in Brazil, where the official language is Portuguese. I do not speak Portuguese, nor am I familiar with the language. I've done my best to listen to pronunciations and try to say them somewhat correctly, but I apologize in advance for what I'm sure will be some mistakes in pronunciation of some of the names. Rio de Janeiro is the second most populous city in Brazil and the sixth most populous in the Americas. As of the 2010 census, there were 5.9 million people living in Rio. The city was originally founded by the Portuguese in 1565, but had been home to at least seven different indigenous groups before the Europeans arrived. Today, Rio's population is made up of 51% white citizens, 36% multiracial, and 11% black citizens. It is home to the largest Portuguese population, outside of Lisbon in Portugal. Rio is known for, among many other things, its beautiful beaches, its lively nightlife, and the massive Christ the Redeemer statue that looms above the city, arms outstretched. Over 50% of Rio's residents are Catholic. It is also known for its annual Carnival, a Brazilian festival that begins on the Friday afternoon before Ash Wednesday and ends on Ash Wednesday at noon, kicking off the 40 days of Lent before Easter Sunday. The festival includes parades, costumes, and dancing during the six-day party. Rio's carnival is recorded as the biggest in the world, according to the Guinness Book of World Records. While Rio is home to many industries, including oil, mining, telecommunications, and science and research facilities, there is also a great disparity between rich and poor citizens. While it has the second-largest municipal GDP, or gross domestic product, in the country, a large number of its residents, over 22%, live in the city's favelas, slums or shanty towns, mostly located in the outskirts of the city. The residents of these favelas live below the poverty line, 95%, as opposed to 40% in the general population. Over 1.5 million people in Rio live in over 700 favelas around the city, out of the sight and mind of most of the general population. Favelas can be traced back to the large migration of Brazilians from the countryside and into the cities during the 1940s to the 1970s. These rural migrants could not afford what little housing was available, so they became squatters, establishing shantytown communities on the periphery of the city. They built makeshift homes from scrap materials and built upon the steep hillsides in Rio de Janeiro and many other areas. These slum neighborhoods are often overcrowded, without running water or proper plumbing or electricity. The crowded and unsanitary conditions lead to problems like pollution and disease. Many of the favela residents do not receive proper nutrition or medical care, and infant mortality rates are high. Even so, the population living in favelas in Rio is increasing, from 18% in the year 2000 to over 22% in 2010. The number of poor and the scarcity of resources has made crime and violence in the favelas skyrocket. Gangs dominate the neighborhoods, and police presence is scarce or non-existent. Small businesses begun by residents to eke out a living and serve the needs of the community are present in the favelas, but they are often shaken down or downright robbed by gangs that prey upon the residents. The main purpose of these gangs is drug trafficking, 
and sales are brisk, as there is a high percentage of drug addiction inside the favelas. This is the world that Clarice Rosa de Nascimento inhabited. She was a resident of the Boa Vista favela in Rio and ran a small makeshift store selling drinks, snacks, cigarettes, and other small items to community members. She was raising her nine-year-old son, Sandro, and an infant daughter alone. On March 27, 1988, Clarice was tending her small shop when three men entered. Whatever happened took place in mere moments. They either demanded money from Clarice, which she did not hand over fast enough, or they entered and immediately began attacking her, then ransacked the place before leaving. Clarice, five months pregnant, and with her little boy Sandro as witness, was stabbed multiple times by the three masked men. A large kitchen knife was left protruding out of her back. She dragged herself out of the building and into the street, screaming for help. She finally lay crumpled in a heap across the street outside. By the time help arrived, she was dead. The baby in utero also perished. The community grieved for the young mother, but her killers were never identified or caught. Sandro and his baby sister went to live with his mother's sister, their Aunt Julieta. Sandro never knew his father and had no living grandparents. Not long after his mother's murder, Sandro took to the streets. His aunt would say that he never talked about his mother or what he had witnessed that day. He never brought it up and acted as if nothing had happened. But she knew he was traumatized because he did not want to stay in the neighborhood where his mother had died. She'd had to hunt for him several times to bring him back home, but soon he would leave the favela again. One day, he simply didn't return. The number of homeless children who live on the streets in Rio is hard to pinpoint since the population is fluid and hard to track. However, the general consensus is that approximately 24,000 children, as young as the age of seven, live on the streets in Brazil. Rio is one of the most populated cities in the country and has a proportionate amount of street kids within its city limits. Children leave home to live on the streets for any number of reasons abuse, neglect, or extreme poverty at home, or because they find themselves orphaned, losing parents to violence, drug addiction, or disease. The youngest children, like Sandro, who was 10 when he left home, quickly learn how to survive the streets by finding a street gang to join. These groups of mostly boys band together for companionship, safety, and to learn from the more experienced boys how to survive the streets. They first start by learning to scrounge or steal food from local restaurants and trash bins. They sleep in doorways, under bridges, and on park benches, sometimes in shifts, to keep an eye out for those who may prey upon them. They soon learn to steal, becoming pickpockets and pilfering from shops. Later, they may graduate to mugging, armed robbery, or work in the drug trade. Some fall into prostitution, both girls and boys, to survive. These children, while easily seen on the city streets, begging, sleeping on the ground, or traveling in gangs, are largely ignored by the population and the authorities. They are not dealt with by the police or local government until they are caught in criminal activity or become a public nuisance. Children are then herded into the juvenile justice system and either locked up in detention facilities that house minors or sent to a reformatory. Some churches and non-government organizations, or NGOs, run a few programs that seek to help these children and get them off the streets through education, drug treatment programs, and foster homes. However, they are challenged economically and logistically and cannot begin to serve the large number of children that need help. Sandra began using drugs at a young age. The youngest street kids and those without money to purchase marijuana or cocaine often begin their life of drug addiction by sniffing glue. This was also Sandra's gateway drug. Some are then recruited by drug dealers as drug mules and are paid with drugs as well as some cash. Later still, if they are trusted, they enter the drug trade, selling for a gang leader who may also offer them protection from predators, police, and other threats. These children see the police force as the enemy and do not trust them. Not only are they threatened with being arrested and thrown into overcrowded and dangerous jails, but they are often beaten and even killed by police officers. I'll talk more about Rio's police force a little later in this episode. Even through all of these dangers, Sandra grew up on the streets and survived into adulthood. He learned to rob and steal, and also worked for drug dealers who he considered his friends. He, like many other street kids, 
walked around with his face covered by a rag, shirt, or towel. This was a sure sign to anyone who saw these kids in the streets that they were out to rob or steal from residents, tourists, or whoever else seemed an easy mark. Still, many ignored them, keeping their windows rolled up and staying away from areas where street kids congregated. Sandro traveled with groups of boys into the streets at night. With their faces covered and at least one gun between them, they would mug drivers waiting at stoplights. The money would be used for food and to feed their drug habits. By the time he'd been on the streets for five years, Sandro had a group of street kids he knew well, hanging out with the same boys most days and bunking down with them most nights. A large group of these kids congregated around Candelaria Church, a large historic Roman Catholic church located in central Rio de Janeiro and just opposite Pius X Square. The priests and volunteers at Candelaria began providing food, shelter, and counseling to as many of the homeless children as they could. The church in the square became a popular spot for street kids to sleep at night. On some nights, there would be hundreds of kids sleeping on cardboard or threadbare blankets around Candelaria. This was home for Sandro for weeks leading up to July 23, 1993, when the Candelaria Street Kid Massacre, as it was later called, took place. The area around Candelaria Church also started to become a hot spot for crimes like pickpocketing, robbery, and drug dealing. The police were given orders to start clearing the area of homeless kids. On July 22nd, the day before the massacre, the police were on site trying to rouse the kids away from the church. In response, the kids began throwing rocks at police cars. Witnesses would later say that while the police retreated, they were heard threatening to come back and get them later. The kids didn't take the police threat seriously, as they had been camping out there for months and had never received more than a warning. But the next night, around midnight, while most of the children were sleeping, Sandro and some other boys saw a few vehicles pull up to the side of the church. A few of the kids who were awake went towards the cars. Sometimes, women from the community would come by and pass out cups of soup to the kids. Some of the children thought these women had arrived. Sandro watched as some of the boys walked around the corner of the church to approach the cars. Just then, they heard a volley of gunfire. The occupants in the cars had begun shooting at the children, some of whom were still sleeping on the ground. There were about 70 boys there that night. Eight boys were killed, and several others were injured. The eight who were murdered were Paulo de Oliveira, 11 years old, Anderson de Oliveira, 13, Marcelo de Jesus, 14, Valdivino de Almeida, 14, a 17-year-old boy only known as Gambasino, Leandro de Conciso, 17, Paulo José da Silva, 18, and Marcos Antonio Alves da Silva, 20. It was later determined that it was indeed police officers driving in unmarked cars with the license plates covered who had fired on the children. Fifty officers were charged with being involved in the massacre. Those who were witnesses were threatened and even attacked by officers. Some left Rio to save their own lives. In the end, only two officers were found guilty and given life sentences for the Candelaria massacre. After the Candelaria massacre, the boys scattered to various places around the city. Sandro began living under a bridge with a couple of other boys. One day they were approached by a man who was a capoeira instructor who offered to let them stay at the nearby Catholic University to learn capoeira. Capoeira is an Afro-Brazilian martial art that combines dance, acrobatics, and music. To become skilled in this sport, participants must show strength and speed, as well as grace. Sandro stayed at the university off and on for two years, and professed to want to increase his skills enough to compete in the sport. Like many people who knew him, his instructor described Sandro as quiet, soft-spoken, polite, and cooperative. Neither he nor any of the other boys once stole from the school, he reported. He would say that Sandro seemed grateful to have a place to live and was happy to be part of a team. However, Sandro had been addicted to drugs since he was prepubescent, and that habit was not an easy one to kick. He had gone from sniffing glue and smoking pot to having a daily cocaine habit. He was able to abstain from drugs for a time while at the university, but before long he was back on the streets committing crimes to feed his habit. 
He was first arrested in December 1993, at the age of 15, for robbery. He was sent to a boys' reformatory. It was there that he saw his younger sister, Annette Julieta, for the first time in a long time when they came to visit him. His aunt said that Sandro was contrite and had confessed to his crime. She hoped that his arrest would help him to change his ways. He said he wanted to do better and would come stay with her when he was released. However, he was supposed to stay at the reformatory possibly until he turned 18, but he and some other boys bribed the guards. Some of the boys at the reformatory were connected with people on the outside with money, drug dealers and kidnappers. Through them, some were able to get money to offer bribes. Allegedly, the bribe guards looked the other way, while several of the boys, including Sandro, escaped on November 1, 1994. He was back on the streets, this time remaining free for three more years. He continued his drug habit and his life of crime, but was older, bigger, stronger, and more well-connected to powerful drug dealers, who kept him safe from cops and predators. But his drug use was increasing, and he had more access to cocaine, his drug of choice. He would go on binges and became increasingly more erratic and take bigger risks. He was arrested again in February 1998 for armed robbery. Now at age 19, he was being sent to big boy jail. He was given a sentence of three years, three months, to be served at the 26th Precinct Jail, known as The Vault. The Vault was one of the worst jails in Rio. The facility doesn't resemble a jail or prison as much as it does a dungeon. It is a concrete hole located underground, filled with cells that are overcrowded and provide only the very basic of necessities. There is no sunlight, and the inmates serve their sentences locked away in small cages that are dark, dank, and depressing. There is no respite from it, and the conditions are so crowded that inmates have to sleep in shifts. Cells meant for four inmates often hold ten or more. There is not enough room for inmates to all lie down or even sit at the same time, so they sleep in shifts. Because there is not even an inch of extra space, prisoners tie their meager belongings, toothbrushes, toothpaste, etc., from strings tied to the ceiling bars. Makeshift hammocks made of blankets or sheets are also hung from the ceiling to give more sleeping or sitting space. In this closed space, there is no air or ventilation, and temperatures on the hottest days can reach over 100 degrees Fahrenheit or 43 degrees Celsius. It is no wonder that many seek to escape. The guards remember Sandro as being well-behaved and never went to give them any problems. On New Year's Eve, 1999, some of the inmates were able to escape their cells and break into the guards' lockers. There they were able to secure a gun and some keys. The breakout was led by some of the most notorious drug dealers who were imprisoned in the vault. At gunpoint, they locked some of the guards in cells and took their keys, opening a few more cells on their way out, releasing more prisoners. One of them was Sandro. A guard who knew and liked him would later report that on his way out, Sandro said to him, Sorry, I gotta go. This is my chance. After he escaped the vault, Sandro called his Aunt Julieta. He told her he was out of prison and promised her that he was going to change his life. He seemed sincere, she said, and she hoped that his time in prison would scare him straight once and for all. He asked her to bring him a pair of tennis shoes, and she did. Sandro then found a place to stay in the Nova Holanda slum. There was an older woman there who offered to take him in as a foster son if he promised to stay out of trouble and get a job. Sandro promised his foster mother, Donna Elza, that he would. For the first time in many years, Sandro had a home. Donna Elza lived simply, but kept her home immaculate and always had a hot meal ready. She spent time talking with the boy and encouraging him, telling him that he could have a good life if he just worked hard and stayed away from trouble. She told him that life was often a struggle, but at the end of that struggle, there could be a good life. She told him he could get a job, get married, and start a family. One day, they could even build a small house next to hers for him and his own family. He could live there as long as he liked. At first, Sandro couldn't believe his luck. He was given his own small room, a bed, clothes, and even a television set. He kept asking if it was really for him, and Donna Elza assured him that it was. However, he made her take the bed out of his room. 
He could not get used to sleeping on it and felt more comfortable lying on the floor with just a pillow and blankets. Sandro spent many hours watching television. Donna Elza said he loved to watch movies and action shows especially. As he was watching, he would often get a faraway look in his eyes. She'd ask him what he was thinking about, and he would tell her that he was going to be famous someday, and she would see him on television. He was sure of it. He said that often, she remembers. So what happened between early 2000 and that fateful day in June of that year is a bit murky. What seems to be true is that Sandro, at first, tried to stay out of trouble and show Donna Elza and his Aunt Julieta that he was trying to do the right thing. After all, he was now almost 22 years old, no longer a kid, and it was time to make some changes in his life. Some kids who grow up on the streets of Brazil and survive turn their lives around once they reach the age of majority. Some can finally find a legitimate job, and so can get off the streets. Some have children and settle down to work and raise their families. And some, like Sandro, have been in and out of jail, have experienced violence on the streets, and simply want to get away from that type of life. Many of Sandro's friends had gotten off the streets, and it seemed Sandro now had an opportunity to do the same. But those that knew him said that Sandro was deep into his drug habit. He was using more cocaine than ever, and his behavior was erratic. It's possible that his drug addiction alone caused him to continue his life of crime. It's also possible that his past demons would not allow him to live a life of peace. While as a young boy, his aunt says he never mentions his mother's murder. As he reached his teen years, he brought it up often. He would even embellish the story, saying he'd watched his mother killed when he was only five or six. According to police records and newspaper accounts, she was killed in March of 1988, and Sandro was born in 1978. And he would go into detail about her attack. He seemed to bring it up at times to garner sympathy or to illustrate his toughness or resilience. It may have been one thing he learned when growing up on the streets, to use whatever you can to gain sympathy, and maybe someone will give you a little money or some food or simply some attention. A sociologist who has studied the street kids of Brazil says that society considers them, quote, non-people. They are almost totally ignored and passed by when they are in the streets begging, sleeping in doorways, or scrounging for food. Most pretend not to see them. It is only when they are committing crimes or becoming a public nuisance that they are even considered at all, and then the police are called. Maybe people ignore them because the problem seems too big. There are so many homeless kids, where would they even start to tackle the problem? Or perhaps it's because people can't relate to them. What kind of substandard families and neighborhoods did these kids spring from to end up on the streets so young? And of course, there is an element of racism. Many of the street kids, like Sandro, are mostly of mixed race, but are considered black because of their complexion. And like in many places, including the U.S., blacks are disproportionately arrested, incarcerated, poor and unemployed in large part due to racist policies. I found it jarring, knowing that these kids are often treated as invisible social pariahs, that many seem to use it to their advantage. Many of the boys on the streets travel the city with their faces covered by rags or shirts. It's a way to stay anonymous so that they're not identified while pickpocketing, stealing, or committing other crimes. So whether it was the trauma of his mother's murder and his life on the streets, or anger at witnessing the massacre of his friends at Candelaria, the horrid conditions and abuse he suffered in prison, his drug addiction, or a combination of all of it, Sandro made a decision to board a bus on June 12, 2000, six months after he escaped from prison, to rob its passengers. The situation would quickly spiral out of control, and his prophetic vision about appearing on television and becoming famous would come to pass, but in a most shocking and tragic way. Hey, Instead of a sponsor break this week, I want to share with you two personal podcast recommendations. These are two shows I think you will like, and I hope you'll check them out. Neither one of these shows either solicited or paid for these plugs. As a matter of fact, they don't even know I'm doing it. I'm sneaky that way. I just wanted to give a little shout out to two podcasts I think are great and should get some attention. 
The first is Trace Evidence. There are over 40 episodes for you to binge on, and Stephen Pacheco puts out a quality podcast. He covers unsolved crimes in a thorough, research-driven, and clearly presented style that I love. Some of my favorite episodes are The Murder of Missy Beavers and The Mysterious Death of Elisa Lamb. He also covers lesser-known cases. Check out Trace Evidence. I think you'll be hooked. The second podcast is hosted by my sister, Yolanda, and her husband, Mark, and is called Not Perfect or Functional. You may remember my sister from my Lacey Peterson episode that she co-hosted with me. Those were fun to do, and you guys let me know how much you liked them. Thanks for your messages. Yolanda and Mark make a great podcast team and cover some really interesting true crime cases. Some of my favorite episodes are The Kidnapping of Sherry Papini, The Juan Catalan Story, and The Murder of Marjorie Nugent. Mark and Yolanda do their research into these cases and present each one thoroughly, with a little discussion, a dash of humor, and from the perspective of two very different individuals who just happen to be married. I think you'll like it, and we'll look forward to spending time with Mark and Yolanda with each new episode. Check out Not Perfect or Functional and Trace Evidence on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. On June 12, 2000, at just around 3 p.m. in the afternoon, Sandro Rosa de Nascimento, age 21, boarded bus number 174 in the Botanic Garden area located in central Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. He was carrying a 38 caliber revolver. His intent was to threaten the 11 passengers on the bus with his weapon and to rob them of their belongings. As he stood up and announced the robbery, one of the passengers was able to signal a nearby police vehicle through an open window. Before the robbery had even begun, a military police officer had cut off the bus with his vehicle. The next events happened quickly. The bus driver brought the bus to a halt and quickly jumped out of the window, leaving it driverless. The military police officer radioed for backup and reported the armed man on the bus and told of the passengers who were still inside. The Rio SWAT team was called, and Captain Batista, a SWAT hostage negotiator, was one of the first to arrive on the scene. Reporters soon learned about the unfolding police action as details were relayed over radios. Within minutes, several news outlets, some with television cameras, arrived and began reporting live. Captain Batista started by making contact with the armed man on the bus. He asked him for his first name, but Sandro wasn't about to identify himself, so Batista said he would call him Sergio. He needed to find out what the man wanted so he could begin negotiating for the hostages and hopefully resolve the situation quickly without anyone getting hurt. Inside the bus, witnesses would say that the mugger had become trapped once the police were called. It was clear that he'd intended to board the bus, rob the passengers, and quickly jump off with the stolen goods. Holding a bus full of hostages was surely not anticipated, and he seemed nervous, which in their minds made him more dangerous. He tried to hide his face by pulling a loose t-shirt around his head, but it kept sliding off, and he wasn't doing a very good job of concealing his identity. He only had one hand to try and tie it back on. The other was holding the gun, and the makeshift mask would not stay in place. He could easily be seen from outside through the large bus windows. When he realized he was trapped, he grabbed one of the passengers and held her in front of him with the gun pointed at her head when he wasn't waving it around. One of the passengers, a young student named Luana Belmont, was crouched down behind one of the bus seats when the man began waving the gun. She had her cell phone with her and began placing several calls, to her home, to her boyfriend, and even to her boss to let him know that she was going to be late for work. She said at first she wasn't too worried because she thought, this is just a mugger who got caught and wants to get out of here. She figured the police would find some way to get him off the bus, either let him go or arrest him and it would all be over and she could get on with her day. But SWAT team officers, Rio police officers, reporters, and onlookers were surrounding the bus. Television cameras were already filming the scene, and events were being televised live as they unfolded to thousands of viewers. It wouldn't be possible for the robber to slip away now. Usually, when there's an active crime scene, the area is cordoned off, and onlookers, bystanders, and media are kept a safe distance away while police are responding. This did not happen during the Bus 174 hostage situation in Rio. First, there were police officers swarming the scene, but no one had set up a perimeter around the bus, nor were they keeping reporters or even civilians away. 
According to reports I read regarding the city police force, the police officers in Rio de Janeiro are not well-trained or well-armed. In fact, according to my sources, police officers in Rio often join the force because they cannot find any other kind of employment. The job is dangerous, not well-paid, and as I mentioned, they are not well-trained. As a result, they have a reputation for shooting first and asking questions later. They are not respected nor trusted by the public for the most part. The Rio SWAT police are another matter. SWAT officers are professionally trained and are required to pass rigorous vetting and training before they can serve. These were the officers who were in charge of the hostage situation that day. However, they needed support from the local police as events unfolded. But because the Rio police were not trained to handle this kind of situation, it was kind of a shit show from the beginning. For one thing, no one had radios or walkie-talkies to communicate with each other so it was hard to relay commands, receive information, or coordinate a plan of action. Even when the leader, Colonel Pentiato, arrived about an hour into the siege, he did not have a radio for communication with his troops and was reduced to using hand signals to give his commands. The press and bystanders stood watching just feet from the bus where the hostage taker was pointing a gun at passengers and out towards the front of the bus. He allowed a woman he was shielding himself in the bus with to open a window and make his demands that a cab be brought to drive him away and to safety. The reality was, Sandro was a sitting duck. If they had wanted to, SWAT snipers could have taken him out with one well-placed shot at any moment. Up to that point, the Rio SWAT team could boast that they had never lost a hostage. The reason they held off was, at first, out of concern for the hostages. But later, there would be another reason. Sandro became increasingly frustrated and took another young woman, named Luciana Carvalho, as his next human shield. With his arm around her neck, he pushed her towards the front of the bus. He then had her sit in his lap while he positioned himself in the driver's seat and demanded that the police and photographers back off from the bus. When they would not, he first threatened to shoot the young girl in his lap and then fired off one shot out of the front window. The hostages started to scream, and Luciana was, of course, terrified. The commander then moved the troops back while at the same time positioning snipers on either side of the road. The bus had stopped in the midsection of town, right in the middle of the botanical gardens, and they were able to use the cover of trees and foliage while still keeping an eye on Sandro in the bus. Still more onlookers and reporters, as well as more officers, continued to arrive. Many people lined the sidewalk just a few yards away from the bus. Sandro began to yell out of the bus windows at officers. Witnesses said he was acting more crazy and frantic. He can be seen in videos opening and closing windows, yelling out of the windows, yelling at the passengers, and pointing the gun at their heads. Some passengers would report that he seemed out of his mind on drugs and very unpredictable. He yelled to the cops that he had no family, and so he had nothing to lose. He would shoot hostages and police officers, too, if they didn't move away from the bus. It was obvious that he was trying to find a way to escape but was feeling frantic that there was no way out. The hostage negotiator and Colonel Pentiato continued to try and talk with him and calm him down. They were positioned right under the windows of the bus, just feet away from him. They told him that if he let some of the hostages go, it would show good faith, and they would continue to negotiate with him. Sandro spoke to one of the young men on the bus, Williams Mora, who was carrying a backpack. Are you a student? Sandro asked him. Yes, Mora replied. Then you should probably go. You'll be late for class, he said. He allowed Mora to leave the bus. Amazingly, none of the officers approached Mora as he left the bus. He seemed unsure of what to do, and then just started walking down the street, away from the bus. Even with no knowledge of police tactics, I would think that they would speak with him to, one, make sure he wasn't injured, and two, interview him to get any information that might be helpful in dealing with the hijacker. But what do I know? The negotiator then asked the hijacker to let others go as well. Sandro then chose another man from among the hostages and let him go. He began to get agitated again after a few minutes of waiting and his demands not being met. Sandro was now asking to be provided with two hand grenades and two guns. This is not what negotiators wanted to hear. They wanted to hear that he would agree to give himself up if they promised he'd be taken alive, which was the typical outcome. Sandro then told a young girl named Janina Neves to empty her purse. He picked up a lipstick and gave it to her. He told her to use it to ride on the bus windshield. 
As he dictated, she wrote printing backwards so it could be read from outside. He's going to kill me. He's going to kill us all at six o'clock. This was all being televised live to the world. It seems that after a while, Sandra was no longer afraid of being shot by police. He could see all the television cameras, photographers, and reporters who were watching. Not only did it make him feel important for the first time in his life, he also felt a sense of protection. While the cameras were on him, they wouldn't dare shoot him, he must have believed. And if that's what he was thinking, he would be right. Orders had been given to the SWAT commander from his superiors, who were not on the scene, by the way, to under no circumstances shoot the hijacker with the world watching. They didn't want the backlash of someone being shot and killed while the public viewed it live on their television sets. That was something to be avoided at all costs. So cameras kept rolling, and Sandro, no longer invisible, began playing to them. He was the action star on television, like he'd always dreamed of, and he played the role to the hilt. He swaggered up and down inside the bus, no longer hiding his face, pointing the gun out of windows, cursing at officers, then switching and placing the barrel of the gun to the head of one hostage and then another. He grabbed one woman or another around the neck and dragged her to the windows or to the front of the bus while shouting that he was going to kill the hostages at six o'clock if his demands weren't met. He shouted to the police and the crowds while holding Janina wrapped in what looked like a sheet. It was wound around him and the girl, keeping her close to him. With his face visible to the world, he shouted out of a window, looking straight into the cameras, the gun pointed at the hostage's head. Check this out, everybody, he said. The same way you are mean, I am not fucking around either. I don't give a shit about you pigs terrorizing me. Some serious shit is going to go down. Stare at my face. Take a good look. You bet it's a crime. It's serious shit. I'm going to blow her head off at six if I don't get a grenade and a rifle. I'm going to put the heat on. Just wait and see. This one's going to die at six. You can film me so the whole country can watch. I'm going to turn the heat up. Fifteen years ago, they tore my mother's head off. I just got out of jail and have nothing to lose. I'm going to put on the heat. This one's going to die first. He then took the gun off his hostage and pointed it out of the window towards the cops, saying, Hear what I say, pigs? You pigs can't terrorize me now. He then dragged Janina, who somehow remained calm, to another open window further down the bus. He continues his rant. This ain't no action movie. This is serious shit, bro. No use in terrorizing me. Didn't you terrorize me when you could? Didn't you kill my friends at Candelaria? I was there. Now, it seemed, Sandro had his chance to vent his rage at everything that had happened in his life. He blamed the police for terrorizing him and for the massacre of his friends at Candelaria. He brought up his mother, but of course, she wasn't killed by police, but by a gang of thieves. But her murder was never investigated or prosecuted, so Sandro might blame the police for that injustice as well. The SWAT team normally had to choose between three options. They could negotiate, use non-lethal action to take the hijacker alive, or use a sniper to shoot and kill him. But since they had been given orders not to shoot the hijacker, their hands were tied. Several times throughout the standoff, there was easily a clear shot where a sniper could have taken the hijacker down. Each time, the commander called the police captain back at headquarters and was told not to use lethal force. Later, it was reported that the police captain had been forbidden to do so by the governor himself. They continued to try and negotiate with Sandro to give himself up. He continued to ask for a hand grenade and a rifle. What he planned to do with them and how it would help him escape alive is a mystery. Sandro continued to pace up and down the bus with Janina, threatening to kill her at six o'clock. Two hours had passed since the hostage crisis began. Then there was another crisis on the bus. Two of the hostages, an older woman named Damiana and a younger woman named Gesa, began signaling that there was a medical emergency. Damiana had a heart condition, and she was beginning to show signs of distress. She began to cry and tell Sandro to let her go. She'd had a previous stroke, she said, and felt like it might happen again. She told him it wasn't their fault, whatever his problems were, so why was he taking it out on them? He told her, Lady, I don't want to kill, but there is no other way. Sandro used the medical situation as a negotiating tactic, saying that if the police didn't give in to his demands immediately, the woman was going to die. 
He accused the police of trying to be heroes, but said they didn't really care about the hostages. Two women were going to die because of their inaction, he said, the woman having the heart attack and the girl who was going to be killed at six. He was getting very agitated again, and at one point, he stuck his arm with the gun and then his whole head out of the window. Damiana would later say, Why didn't they shoot him then? What were they waiting for? He only had one gun. Why didn't they shoot his arm at least that held the gun? A former SWAT sniper would later explain that again it was being broadcast live, and if they shot him in the head at that moment, it would have been a horrible thing that the entire country would have seen on their television sets that night. However, he explained, even so, that would have been the right thing to do. If a sniper shot had hit him in the triangle between his nose and mouth, it would have hit his central nervous system, and he'd be dead in seven milliseconds. There wouldn't even be a muscle spasm. We had men capable of taking that shot. It was later also reported that there had been at least 10 opportunities where snipers had a clear shot, but the colonel was forbidden to give the order to do so. The hostages themselves began to shout at the police to do something. Damiana knew she had to get off the bus and get medical help soon, so she told Sandro about her son who was in prison. She tried to connect with him in hopes he might show some mercy. Gesa, who had stayed close to Damiana, was also desperate to get off the bus. She, of all the hostages, seemed the most terrified. She told Sandro that Damiana was her mother and she wanted to take her off the bus because she was sick. He finally agreed to let Damiana go. Gesa tried to follow her out, but Sandro stopped her. Gesa could be heard wailing that she needed to go with her mother, but he only allowed Damiana to leave. She was rushed to a nearby ambulance. She'd had a small stroke and lost the ability to speak even after she'd recovered. It was now 5.30 p.m., It had been two and a half hours since the beginning of the hostage situation. It was also only a half an hour until 6 p.m., the time the hijacker said he would kill the first hostage. At 5.35, Sandro placed a blanket over Janina's head and told her he was going to count to 100 and then shoot her. He marched her up and down the bus, counting to three, and then skipping to 60. It's possible he didn't know how to count. Sandro couldn't read or write, having had very little schooling. Or maybe he was just impatient. Yelling out to the cops what was going to happen next, he made Janina kneel down on the floor of the bus, and then he put the gun to her head. But then he made her stand up again and started pacing and counting some more. Sandro told a couple of the other hostages to go to the window and tell the cops he was going to kill the girl. They began to plead with the officers outside to do something. Once again, he made Janina kneel on the floor. She could no longer be seen from the outside of the bus, but he could be seen standing over her with the gun pointed at her. The cops outside pleaded with him to point it away from the girl. He continued to threaten to kill everyone if he didn't get his hand grenades. He then grabbed a second hostage, Gesa, around the neck and turned back to Janina. He pointed the gun down at her and fired. Gesa began screaming hysterically. Sandro shoved her over to the window where she began to scream out to the police that he'd killed Janina. Sandro then threatened to kill everyone. Still, the police didn't rush the bus or try and take a shot, which would have been the normal protocol. If a hostage is hurt or killed, the most important and immediate priority is to save the remaining hostages. But the command was still not given to the SWAT team, and they could not act without authorization. However, in reality, Sandro had only mimicked shooting Janina, he'd shot into the floor next to her. He'd told Janina that he wasn't going to kill her, but he was going to pretend to. He told her to stay on the ground. He also told the other girls to scream and pretend that they'd seen her get shot. This was the only way they would give in to his demands, he told them. Otherwise, none of them would get out of there alive. They decided to play along. The negotiator then tried to appease Sandro by saying they had a driver coming to drive the bus away. They said it would take time to get the driver to the scene. Their stalling was making Sandro more desperate and unpredictable. Gesa, the girl who had been most terrified from the start, now became Sandro's main target. Grabbing her by the hair, he began shoving her around the bus while yelling at the officers that she would die next. Of all the hostages, Gesa was the one most visibly upset. 
At times, it seemed, she could barely stand. Time was almost up, he screamed. The next girl would die soon. Some believe that Sandro became angry at Gesa because she told him Damiana was her mother, which wasn't true. He found out that she had lied when he asked her what prison her brother was in. Damiana had said her son was incarcerated. When she couldn't answer, he became enraged and began menacing her even more with a gun and threatening to shoot her. In fact, Gesa was a close friend of Damiana's daughter. She knew Damiana's son and that he was in prison, but he'd been moved to different prisons frequently, and she could not recall the name of the place he was incarcerated. Sandro then had Janina stand up to show the cops that she wasn't dead, but threatened once again to kill her. He placed the gun against her forehead, and at that point, she looked truly scared. She later said that she was scared, but she put on more of a show, crying and pleading, because that's what he had told her to do. The cops weren't taking him seriously, and he needed to prove he wasn't bluffing anymore. Janina didn't know if he was pretending, if he'd really kill her, or if she'd be shot accidentally. Gesa was now practically frozen with fright. He let her sit down, and Janina tried to comfort her, telling her that he wouldn't really kill her. Janina continued to talk to him, asking Sandro about his sister. He answered her questions, telling her how old she was and what she looked like. She continued to try and connect with him, to keep him calm, like the negotiators had advised her through the window. He sat down, his arm around her, her arm around Gesa. Finally, she said, you know who the biggest victim on this bus is? As he looked down at the floor and shook his head, she softly said, you. She saw remorse on his face, like he felt guilty for what he'd done. A few moments later, he took Gesa by the arm once again and walked her to the front of the bus. Janina followed behind. He then used the lever to open the bus doors. Yelling out to the cops to stay back and telling them not to make any funny moves, he walked out of the bus with Gesa, holding her close in front of him. It was just before 7 p.m., and it was dark now. The police hadn't anticipated Sandro leaving the bus with a hostage. When he approached the commander, with Gesa as a human shield, it seemed he thought he could use her to convince the police to let him walk away. How he expected that to happen is a mystery. Or perhaps he simply wanted it to end. He had to know he would most likely be killed. But he took a very dangerous situation and made it worse by leaving the bus with a hostage. He was only a couple of feet away from the commander, who was trying to talk him into letting Gesa go. Suddenly, from behind and to the right of Sandro, a SWAT officer approached, his gun pointed at Sandro's head. When he was just a foot away from him, Sandro noticed and turned. He moved his head an inch or two in reaction as the officer fired off two shots. Sandro jerked away, falling to the ground, taking Gesa with him. His finger squeezed the trigger as he went down. The officer's first bullet didn't hit Sandro, but Gesa, who was shot in the face. As he went down, Gesa was shot with Sandro's gun. She'd be shot three times, once in the face and twice in the back. She was killed instantly. Captain Batista grabbed for the gun, disarming Sandro as he fell. But the bullets had all been spent. The officers ran towards Sandro, thinking he'd been shot but he hadn't. Once they realized this, the officers surrounded him, forming a shield. The crowds of people who'd been there all day, watching events as they unfolded, immediately began to run towards Sandro, crying out, Kill him! Kill him! The police knew he'd be torn to pieces or lynched if they didn't get him out of there. He was thrown into the back of a police van while cameras continued to roll. He is seen in the video, still very much alive, lying on his side and then his back on the floor of the van. At least two officers in full uniform jump on top of him, their arms up near his head, while they kneel on his chest and legs. Minutes later, when the vehicle reached the police station, Sandro was dead. It was determined that he'd died of asphyxiation. During the investigation into his death, officers would say that Sandro had struggled and assaulted the officers, kicking out a window and breaking one of the officers' arms. They'd had to suffocate him to, quote, make him faint, they explained. After an investigation, the officers were cleared of any wrongdoing. Gesa Fermo Gonsalves was 20 years old. She'd been on her way to work the day she was killed. 
her funeral was attended by hundreds. A young and innocent girl, just starting out in life, was killed due to the actions of one man and the inaction of the police who were supposed to protect her. Sandro de Nascimento's aunt, Julieta, declined to collect his body for burial. She was afraid if she did so, the public would turn against her and make her a target. Later, Sandro's foster mother, Donna Elza, claimed his body. She alone was present at his burial. Looking at how these events unfolded, we can see how poorly the situation was handled. If it had been handled differently, perhaps none of the hostages would have died, and Sandro could have been taken alive. There were untrained and ill-equipped police officers, and the professionally trained SWAT team had their hands tied by government officials. These officials were not even present at the scene, and could not have been the most informed on how to best handle the situation. The media and the televised coverage was also a factor. It created a whole separate set of circumstances for the police and hostage negotiators to deal with when they needed to be focused on the safety of the hostages. Without the television cameras there, the colonel might have been given permission to use a SWAT sniper to take out the hijacker, thus ensuring the safety of the hostages. What were some alternatives? Could they have sent an officer to drive the bus away? If they'd offered that in exchange for the hostages being released, might have Sandro agreed? It seemed that he was just looking for a way out. Most who knew him believed that he never would have killed anyone. He'd never physically harmed anyone in his life, they said. They think that if he'd been given a way out, a way that could have saved his own life as well, he would have taken it. Of course, we can go back even further and ask if traumatized children like Sandra were prioritized and given help and support, rather than being left to the streets, perhaps they wouldn't turn to a life of crime in the first place. Social workers in Brazil say that these children are forced to steal and commit crimes just to be able to eat. Or we can go back even further and look at the poverty and crime in the favelas. Why is this allowed to continue? Why are the poor in Brazil forced into such conditions? Why isn't there a way out of poverty for tens of thousands of its citizens when Brazil has a thriving economy? Of course, we can ask that of many other countries as well. These problems are not limited solely to Brazil. I'll end with a quote from the film Bus 174, a documentary that covers in detail Sandro's life and the hijacking of Bus 174. There you can see the entire footage of the hostage-taking as it was recorded live virtually from start to finish. It is a haunting film. In it, a sociologist is asked for his opinion. Could the outcome have been any different? He answers, Society wants all the Sandros to vanish, because it cannot bear reality. Invisibility is perfectly accomplished by death. That will do it for this episode of Once Upon a Crime. You can support the podcast on Patreon by going to patreon.com slash onceuponacrime. There you can get bonus episodes as well as thank you gifts and other perks. You can follow me on Twitter at Upon a Crime and on Facebook and Instagram at Once Upon a Crime Pod. You can also join our Facebook group. Look for it under Once Upon a Crime Podcast fan page. Once Upon a Crime is written, produced, and edited by me, Esther Ludlow. Till next time, be good to one another. Music